Hello and welcome to the Inside Edge podcast, where we go beyond the headlines to bring you the real stories behind the sports we love. I'm Bavi Devchan, and I'm excited to take you on a journey deeper into exploring what potential really looks like. In each episode, we'll be chatting to athletes and a range of experts to uncover how they organise their inner world to navigate the highs and lows of elite sport. The purpose? To help you shift your perspective, connect to what really matters, and find your flow. Jane, welcome to the podcast. I am super excited to have you on. You're someone I've looked up to for a long time. We caught up for coffee, I think it was three years ago now, um, and you are a culture and leadership consultant. Um, where I want to start is actually a fairly simple question, but might be a complex answer. But what does that actually mean? <laughs> yeah, well, it's great to catch up again, Barbie. I I, uh, I love what you do, and I love um, I love the podcast. And it has been a while since we caught up, so we're probably due for another coffee at some stage in Richmond. But I I feel like that title consultant. Whilst that is technically what I do, it's a bit misleading because I think sometimes there's a bit of a stigma associated with consultants. People have this view in their mind of a consultant being someone that's in this fancy suit that comes in and they get paid a lot of money to deliver these um, recommendations and it's all care, no responsibility, and then they take off and they don't have any ownership over the work that they've done as a consultant. And, of course, I'm generalising there, but that couldn't be further from who I am and the way I do what I do uh, because a really important part of what I do, particularly in sport but also in business, is almost being a pseudo member of the team in a lot of ways. Uh, You have to be independent. You have to be impartial. You have to be objective. You've got to be able to challenge people and ask questions and not be afraid to to sort of – uh, work against the status quo to help a team grow. But at the same time, you've got to be in the trenches. Like you've got to show that you wouldn't ever ask anyone to do something you wouldn't do yourself. I think that's a really important principle of it. And you've got to have a bit of skin in the game as well too. Like you've got to have people see that you can be trusted because if you're working in that people space and you're trying to help people get better and improve and grow personally or professionally, then it all kind of links back to the relationship and the quality of relationships that you've got with people so if you're in and out it doesn't help that doesn't foster that and so that that's always a really important principle of what I do is um I want to be objective but also want to be able to help coach them through good times and bad times so I'm very grateful to work with some amazing organizations in sport and and business and yeah love what I do which is which is a really important ingredient of a of a great vocation I suppose yeah I had a feeling that you would not like the, the word consultant or wouldn't exactly <laughs> gel with it, so I, I thought it might lead beautifully into what you mentioned there is the people side of it. And if we if we think about performance is where a lot of people would start taking sport as a big area that you've worked in and you're in business as well. And ultimately, a lot of organisations are judged on do you win games do you make money, your, your bottom line, external outcomes. However, the processes to get there in terms of really focusing on your people are so, so important. And as you, as you know, and I'm sure we'll talk through, that definition of success can actually then change and expand and grow into, well, it's not just about the wins, but how are we impacting society at large. If we come back to the people side of it, though, what what are you actually doing with people and with humans? When you talk about we focus on people, I go into an organisation and help their people be better at what they do. What what exactly is that? Well, it probably depends a little bit on what stage a team's at. So some of the work you do will be working with a new group of people. So there's a new team, there's new leaders, um, there might be a new board, new ownership, and a new coach, new, new players, and you might be helping a team lay some foundations and when I talk about foundations what do we want to stand for as a group where are we going like what's that vision that that piece you mentioned around success is a really big part of that is what does success look like for us and that's not just the scoreboard like scoreboard's always going to be a part of success uh, in team sport or in sport full stop but it's much more than that because if you're judging yourself only by what happens on the scoreboard, then you're overlooking all of those things that happen every day in every moment of every day 
that help get you closer towards that vision at the end of the day. Uh, one of my mentors is a, a lady named uh, Dr. Pippa Grange, who some of your listeners might be familiar with. Uh, Pippa worked in Australia for a long time as a psychologist, performance psychologist. She's from England originally and she's back home living in England now. And she's got a great book called Fear Less, How to Win at Life Without Losing Yourself. And I encourage people to get a copy of that book if they're interested in that sort of sports sports performance uh Uh, leadership space but Pippa talks about the difference between deep wins and shallow wins and I really love that in the context of sport because sometimes you can win on the scoreboard you can win in a game and it doesn't feel like a win like you sort of go through the motions a little bit and you might get the job done but you don't get that deep satisfaction other times you can lose a game but you can feel that you've played really well because of the way that you've played or um, the individual game you might have played or the way you've executed your role. Uh, And then the other side of that is that every single day there's opportunities to see or acknowledge deep wins all around us. And that might be things that you're doing for one another. It might be helping a colleague or a teammate. Uh, It might be having a difficult conversation with a coach that helps them get from point A to point B. Um, So I think that the deep wins are all around us and being able to have a conversation around what does success look like, what does winning look like, and then what sort of wins do we want to have together as a group to help build our culture together, uh, to be a place where not just we can perform and achieve great things on 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 the field or on the pitch or on the track or whatever your sport or field might be, but also, um, what what can we do to grow as human beings? That's a really important part of a lot of the work I do is is trying to create an environment where people can thrive. So we want we want thriving humans in all areas of their life, um, and no one gets that perfect. But we you, you want to be a part of an environment where you feel supported, where you feel seen, where you feel heard, and where you feel you can make a real contribution, where you can apply your gifts and strengths. Like everyone has incredible gifts and strengths and different roles within different team environments give us a chance to bring those gifts and strengths to life and we want to be a part of a team where we feel we can do that every day. And so helping helping the leaders of a team create that type of environment is something that, uh, that I'm very passionate about, yeah. Yeah, that, that's awesome. There's so many things there. Firstly, the winning shallow, winning deep from Dr. Pippa Grange is one of the things I've found constantly talking about and especially in the current culture and world where we've got social media right there, we're constantly seeing the highlight reels, the wins and all the cool stuff on the outside. And a recent story is someone like Meg Lanning who's won almost everything there is that to be won and she, she was on our podcast as a guest a couple of years ago and this is probably just before she started to, to struggle that little bit more but she spoke a lot about how she just found herself chasing anti-success and it's, yes, you've got all the things, what a great life, travel the world, play a game, get paid a lot of money to do it, but that real deeper meaning as to why am I doing what I'm doing, how am I deeply impacting someone else is so important. And I guess to help, a lot, a lot of listeners of this podcast are either coaches or players generally around cricket, and they know that focusing on people is important, they know that who they are and understanding that's important. But what they don't know is where on earth to start. Yep. So could you yep. give a little bit of guidance or whether it's um, maybe maybe more so a player and how, how would they start looking internal and then maybe we can move on to more of a leadership lens of how do you help others? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think there's, well, there's a number of different ways to do it. I think the... The principle that's really important as a coach or a captain, for example, and you're starting to guide your team through that process is work out what, what works, what will work for us. I think knowing your people is a really big part of that. So if I know my people, then I know what will land and what won't land. And so, and co-designing an approach too, like that's always a big principle of the work I do. A lot of the stuff we do is with player leadership groups. So that sort of executive committee of a, of, of a playing group that helps sort of steer the destiny of the team if you like and um you know be conduit between the coaching staff and the broader playing group so involve 
the people that are in the team in the process of developing the process that you'll use to grow together as a team. I think that that's sometimes overlooked is the coach feels like they've got to go away and plan these sessions and then bring those sessions to the group or the captain feels like they've got to go and plan those sessions and then run those sessions with the group. But I feel like the the one of the most important parts of of building a team vision is actually involving the team in the process of building the process. <laughs> so that might sound, sound a little bit funny, but it, it doesn't matter so much as to the output as the process you follow to get to that output. Um, so it's like team values, for example, and I know um, – we're going to talk about that at some stage around having some values that have strong buy-in from the broader team that represent who you are and what's uniquely you. It doesn't really matter whether you come up with two words or three words or five words, uh, and it doesn't matter how good they look on the wall. What matters is the process you followed to build those. And so I think involving the team in as many stages of that as possible is always a really healthy a feature of a process and we call that co-design now, that's the sort of the technical jargon that's associated with that but designing the process you'll use to create those team foundations with the team that's actually working with it so that's from a team perspective and to your question around where does an individual start i think not over complicating it is just asking yourself what's my why you know, and you think, well, what's my why? Gee, that's a big question <laughs> to ask. What well, that existential questions that we all ask ourselves, whether we're twenty, whether we're thirty, whether we're fifty, whether we're seventy. No, no one probably ever really nails it perfectly, and it it changes over time as well too. It evolves and changes. But trying to break that down in terms of what's my why? So what lights me up? What am I passionate about? Uh, who, who's in my inner sanctum that, that helps drive me to be my best? Now, I've got a colleague over in the US is a guy by the name of Afdal Aziz and he has a, a program that he calls or sort of a, a, a book and a program called uh, Good is the New Cool and he's, he's a purpose ex- expert and he has a model that he uses to help people discover their why or their purpose, whatever language you want to use around it, and he calls it the GPS model. And each of the letters, G, P, and S, each stand for something. It's an acronym. And I love that notion of the GPS model because we use a GPS to help get us from point A to point B. So we jump on Google Maps, we key in where we're going, and hopefully it takes us there without too many detours. Uh, But it's that notion of having a true north, like something that guides you towards where you want to be. And if that changes over time, that's okay. But you're stopping and you're pausing and you're reflecting on what that might be in any given moment. And so the GPS model that Afdel uses with his clients, uh, G stands for uh, gifts. So what gifts do I have that are uniquely me? Uh, so what are my gifts and strengths? Uh, P, uh, P is uh, passions. So what am I passionate about? So what are my gifts and strengths? What am I passionate about that lights me up? And then S is service. So how can I, based on my gifts and my passions, how can I be of service to others? And for an athlete, right now, as a young athlete in a team environment, that might be about the contribution that you can make on the field. But it also might be about being a great teammate. Uh, It also might be about being a great brother or sister or mother or father. It also might be about what you can do in the community in using your voice and we've seen that with the Australian men's and women's team. Like they've got elite athletes who are absolute masters of their craft, but then they're fabulous human beings that are using their profile to help progress social causes, uh, and and they're using their profile for good. And so that's an example of GPS in action. You know, what are my gifts? What are my passions? And how can I be of service based on that? And I think that that's a good starting point uh, to, to work with. That's one model, but there are others out there. I think that, you know, what's my why, even itself as a question, can lead to some fascinating insights from someone. And if they don't nail it straight away, that's okay. Hopefully in sharing what your why is with a group of teammates in a safe environment, you will have at least learned something new about that person. Yeah, I love that as a concept and that what's your why gives you that sense of inner self-worth or self-awareness where you're able to actually get some context so you're not constantly searching for that outside of yourself in a sense. And when you mention there is you want to then bring it into a safe environment. Now, this is a part where it's 
even more important again from a leadership point of view is how do you actually what are the elements that make up that safe environment that allows people to then say well I can speak my truth and not be worried about the old FOPO what, what are the people thinking of me or how is this gonna is the coach gonna think I'm this that the other about me like what are the key elements that make up that safe culture where you can just express yourself yeah, well, there's some fabulous resources out there around psychological safety and people uh, will be well placed to go and look into that more, read more about what psychological safety is, how to establish it, uh, what are some of the building blocks of creating an environment where that's present. I feel like psychological safety can often be, it's a very technical term though as well too, so breaking it down into a more simplistic form, what do we mean by psychological safety? And I feel like belonging is a word that is just so uh, you can kind of use it almost in the place of psychological safety as an environment of belonging. So, how do we want to? How do we create a place where people feel ownership over where they are? Um, they can allow their true selves to be seen. They don't have to wear a mask. They don't have to turn up to work or to the team environment, the training facility every day and all of a sudden go from being who they are at home to being a completely different person. Uh, so, And that that's things like um, being able to wear what you want and not be criticised um, uh, from a fashion viewpoint, being able to sort of uh, bring to, to life your little quirks and idiosyncrasies that make you uniquely you, um, which is a, a big part of of being human is we don't have to fall in line with this robotic definition of what it means to be a member of this team environment is that you can feel that you're making a contribution through being who you are uh, and feeling comfortable as a result. Now, that doesn't mean you don't work hard, but the fact that you feel like you belong there means that you'll work even harder <laughs> because you want to be the best possible version of yourself and make the biggest possible contribution you can. And so that's probably been the big shift we've seen, isn't it, where I think once upon a time the traditional model in sport in particular was the young players would come into the environment and they'd have to you know, earn their stripes uh, before they could be considered a proper member of the team environment. And that's that shift we've seen is that now leaders of any team environment are seeing that the more comfortable they make those young athletes from the moment that they arrive, the sooner that they settle the quicker that they feel that that environment's their environment rather than a new environment or a foreign environment, then the sooner that they'll thrive. Uh, and so I think that that shift is a really healthy evolution in the context of safety because it enables people to get from where they are now as a beginner perhaps or a first-time player or a new player um, to being someone who feels equal ownership over the environment as if they've been there for, for 10 years. Uh, and so I think that, that that part of things is a really powerful component of that. Yeah, it's, it's almost a complete flip, isn't it, in, in the sense of you come into a team as a youngster 20, 30 years ago and it's earn your stripes, you don't sit in this part of the change rooms um, until you've earned that opportunity to do so. And even when you mentioned something around it sounds so small in the context of everything but what you're wearing and it immediately triggered like when I was younger in the, the squad here in Perth and had, as it is, a, a quiet kid, not so confident, always found myself trying to fit into different environments. You could probably go back a step further and say there's not too many Indian-looking Zimbabwean-born people with an Aussie accent <laughs> trying to play sport. I just was different in almost every environment that I walked into. Uh, but I found that I'd get so concerned about something as small as was I wearing slides or was I wearing thongs or flip-flops um, and what was the cool thing to be wearing. And you're so focused on something as small as that, I didn't have the brain power to go, what's my tasks at training today? <laughs> How am yeah. I getting better? How, like uh, I did, It was all about... How do I belong in this environment? And there's probably a couple of alpha leaders there that didn't make it. It goes both ways where it was a tough existence in a sense. Um, but the flip on that is that now walking into environments, and even if it's not in a sporting context, in a work context where I'm still the junior and still look at eyes I've opened completely in awe of a lot of things and confused and lost half the time, but the, the model is changing where people come to you and say, 
how can we make this experience better for you? What are you seeing? Actually, you've got fresh eyes in this environment. Is there anything that you see that could be done better? And it's a complete shift in how, like just from a personal experience, how I feel, how I want to contribute. So I, I can genuinely feel that change and that 180-degree shift. Um, I guess the challenge can be not just in Australia, but if we flip it over to an Eastern context. So within cricket, India, obviously a powerhouse. Uh, you've got Pakistan, Sri Lanka, a lot more of an Eastern culture where things are different from a social hierarchical need, your respect for elders, your willingness to challenge elders. And the, the concept of as a younger player or player-coach relationship, the concept of giving that player ownership and responsibility is so far from a, like, ignore sport for a moment, but a cultural point of view. Do you have any thoughts on how some of these concepts can be implemented when it's so deeply ingrained in those sorts of cultures? Yeah, oh, I mean, that, that's a, f a fabulous question and I appreciate you sharing those anecdotes you have because I, I've, I've sort of hoped that that change is happening, um, but I think we've still got a long way to go as well and and so there's a couple of things with that. I think once upon a time it was very – not that long ago and probably still in some team environments, it was about fitting in with the culture. So the culture fit piece was the language that – people would often use from a re recruitment viewpoint and and coaching and culture viewpoint and i just think that that's misses the whole point of team sport to and team environments full stop is that teams are great not because everyone's the same teams are great because everyone's different and they find a way to make it work on the field and that's where you get a team sport like our sports cricket and the football codes if you like um, you can have people from just entirely different backgrounds and walks of life and that you could not get more different people if you tried but they come together and they create this harmonious flow in the context of a training performance or a game performance you think how is that possible or how is that possible uh, and there's just something almost like magical or mystical about it and i don't think it's a structural or tactical thing i think it's uh a reality of human nature that probably is a bit of a microcosm for society at large is that if we actually see diversity as strength we become better people if we see diversity as strength we'll, we'll become a stronger community if we see diversity as strength we will become you know a bit much better human race and too often we focus on difference um and we see difference as a bad thing but difference is a good thing you know, it's what makes the world go around. And so having that conversation as a team around what are the things that are important to us, and I'll get to your, get to your question about the Eastern cultures shortly and and just try and think about that a little further. But if, if we can, you know, to your earlier question around where do you start, I think it's really important when you have that conversation around what type of team environment do we want to create is to call out things, not like the obvious, we want to win on the scoreboard, we want to have high standards, we want to work hard, but also to talk about things like we want to embrace diversity. We want to allow people to be themselves. We want to see diversity as strength. Um, we want to see difference as our competitive advantage. So being able to tease out some of those traits as part of those early conversations when you're first forming the team um, so that we're looking at culture add. It's not culture fit, it's culture add. Is that people that come into the environment, it's an additive process. They make it better. They complement. They add layers to us that makes us stronger and better um, and more formidable than what we would have ever been if we were on our own. Um, in that sort of homogenous setting. So so that's probably the first thing that comes to mind. I mean, I, I'm from a privileged background as a sort of a white male living in Australia, so I, I haven't um, encountered some of the, the, the prejudice um, that exists uh, in, in some of those environments in terms of direct lived experience. But the thing that comes to mind when I hear you talk about that is is if you're someone that's not in a leadership role in one of those organizations or one of those teams is that the cultural norms might prevent you from challenging authority is that there's two things there one is that there's no reason why you can't establish new cultural norms as a team and i feel like having leaders or coaches who understand the value of 
our team culture doesn't have to necessarily mimic culture at large in society. It can actually be different if we want it to be. So what are the things that are important to us and engaging them in that conversation can be important. But if, you, if you're struggling with that or there's pushback against that, which there often can be, is just living as truly to your personal values as you possibly can. So it's almost that notion of starting in your own backyard first is your backyard might be showing up every day to training and to games and just bringing the most authentic version of you that it's hard for people not to to be inspired by that or to be encouraged to, to see things a different way. And by you doing that, it then creates this contagious energy with your teammates where they then start doing that as well too. And then you're, you're almost influencing change from just how truly you're living the best version of you. Um, if, 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 if being able to give feedback up the line and down the line and side to side is important, for example, then if you're someone who role models that in your own way, even if you're not a leader, uh, that will become contagious or it has the potential to become contagious if you go about it the, the, the right way. Um, so that's one thing that comes to mind. The other thing is that I feel like everyone, even coaches and leaders, like coaching and leadership is lonely. It's a lonely place. And that's probably a big part of my work is trying to make leadership less lonely. And so some coaches, they only act that way because they've either never learned another way <laughs> or because they've learned off leaders who did it so poorly themselves. Like they've taken the, the, the worst of the people that they've worked under as distinct from the best of the people that they worked under. So I think that coaches and leaders, even if they don't explicitly say it, they're, if they're driven to be the best versions of themselves, then they'll be hungry for feedback and information on what they can do differently or do better. And so a nice little trick I find in that feedback space is you could actually say to your leader or your coach, I'd love to get some feedback, coach. Um, you know, I'd love to get some feedback around this area of my game or this part of my leadership or, you know, this thing that I'm doing away from sport. Uh, and they're going to lean into that and say, yeah, of course, that'd be great. I'll catch up and we'll, I'll give you some feedback. And then in that conversation, um, you could actually just ask the question, like, would you like some feedback too? <laughs> or is there anything that I can share with you that might be helpful for where you're at in your role? And if you're kind of inviting them as to whether they would like the feedback or not, it then creates this nice opening whereby they can either say no to that um, or be challenged by that or they might actually say well yeah I've just given you some feedback so I'd love some feedback you know what have you got for me and so then that sort of creates a bit of an opening for for where you might be able to have a conversation you might not otherwise be able to have um, you're leading by example yourself you're role modeling um, and you're coming from that position of, of sort of human to human as distinct from coach and player uh, in, in a traditional hierarchical sense yeah, do, do, do you think that that would – are those things useful based on your experience, Barbie? Yeah, 100%. Um, I, I don't know a clear answer as to how to make this happen, but the concepts you just spoke about are so true across humankind. Like human nature, we want to belong. We want to feel safe. Uh, we also want to grow and achieve things. And I think my gut feel, I just spent three weeks in India exploring this, asking a lot of questions. Sometimes it was extremely difficult to have a conversation like this because it's just so far a stretch from hit a million balls and make a million runs and that's how, that's everything kind of sense. Um, but sport has the opportunity to create societal change too. And when you mentioned that our team culture doesn't need to be necessarily the broader culture, that's so true. And what comes to mind is that there's two bits in India anyway. Virat Kohli is someone who completely and utterly changed the way professional cricket is done over there by owning who he is, by leaning into his story, by going back to his dad passed away when he was young. What did that inspire? How did that create change? What did that do to a little chubby kid who could hit a ball well? And he's now... <laughs> Fit, fitness fanatic he gets in the contest he's feisty probably a little bit of a dusty martin um <laughs> now that i think of it but now you go and even in the space of the last four or five years the change in young males and females pursuing sport and the way they go about that's completely and utterly different that's that's one example from the men's side as an individual and the power to actually create shifts and 
take it out of cricket and into wider society, all of a sudden the fitness conversations are getting the best out of yourself, podcasts, growth, like that's all growing yeah. exponentially as humans that is and not not just do your studies, get married, to like fit into this already formed storyline and that's just what you do. Um, and on the other side of it I found – uh, Royal, I don't know how much you followed the WPL, which is the Women's Premier League, but Royal Challengers Bangalore women's team, you might find it really interesting reading up as to how they went about creating that culture and environment from 12 months ago to just winning it um, a, a couple of months ago in that it was that empowerment to the captain. So rather than the coaches and the team managers and the owners deciding who'd be employed, the recruitment strategies, everything it was it was handed over to the skipper and the skipper said this is how i see things um let's all sit down together and work this out as a group then we're going to bring in our key leaders how do our key leaders and key players how do we make them feel really comfortable and how do we co-create this environment as a playing group as well so little things like elise perry coming over superstar but how do we make she's got to spend three four weeks in india how do we make this experience for her an unbelievable experience? So surround her with some of her good friends and people that she gets on with really well. How do we make some social activities? So because four weeks in India can be a horrible time or yeah. it can be the time of your life. But yep. it was about yep. the experience itself. Now, these conversations were never, like, so, so, so rare. Um However, using that storytelling and really blasting that out to the world to show that, hang on, we've gone people first, we've gone great experience, we've gone co-creation, and there's a win at the end of it. Now, using that hierarchical environment, what speaks? Winning. So, so using, like, rather than fighting against all the time, we're like, hang on, these guys win, let's just ask the question of why. Why? Why did, yeah. they, yeah. Why, why did they all, even if, and, and you could say T20 is such a fickle game and over or two and it's a completely different result. We're not talking about them at all. Um, however, if you just dial it back to the team that finished second as well, Delhi, De, Delhi Capitals, they actually did something really similar, very similar that people focused and you just start to see themes and I think you've almost got to use the system in looking at teams that are succeeding and then working that backwards that even when they don't succeed, is this the right way to do things? Yeah, absolutely. And that's I mean, that, that's great to hear that. And those two examples you've mentioned there, that they, they become case studies, don't they? And so that's the other thing that comes to mind is there's so much great content out there. There's so much information out there around what's happening behind the scenes of so many of these sports all around the world. Is is as a leader in that or a coach in a setting where you're trying to influence people to do things a different way, just keeping your eyes and ears open for case studies that you come across that might actually be useful, and you just send an article or you send a podcast or you, you flick a video onto the coach and say, "Oh, I just saw this the other day. It's pretty interesting about this storytelling exercise that uh, one of the other teams was doing. You know, do you think we could use any of that here ourselves?" And sometimes just that sheer weight of momentum that comes from seeing that something works is enough to get you moving in that direction because there is a bit of follow the leader that takes place so i think that that's a great one I, the other couple of things that come to mind is um around uh yeah the storytelling piece well there's a couple of things one is culturally celebrating culture so it, there, uh, there's uh, like we live in a world where there's just cult cultures um the, the environments are very diverse. So whether there's one person from a particular culture in a team or whether there's 10 people from a particular culture in a team, having the opportunity to celebrate culture. Uh, one of the teams I work with had a, a culture day recently and they just did a wonderful job. It was It was as far from tokenistic as you could possibly get. But what they'd done was they identified all of the different lineages of all of their players, coaches and staff in the building and they created a cultural expo of sorts where they had uh, a two-hour window. It wasn't a big kind of chunk of time. It was a two-hour window during one of their work days at a time when the players weren't training and they set up stations around their training facility where they'd empowered each of those different cultural groups to create an activity or an experience that would give people a chance to immerse themselves in that culture. 
And so people were going from Scotland to India to uh, Tonga to um, England to Ireland to and it was and it was just unbelievable to see the energy that was created through the actual process of creating that event and that experience but then also the way it brought those different cultural groups closer together and then the way it brought the overall team closer together uh, and one of their values is belonging and so that was the the motivation for doing that but it was just such a novel idea that seemed to work so well i know some of the rugby league teams uh, there's a high pacifica population uh in rugby league here in australia and so they'll do regular cultural nights, cultural days, and food is a really big part of that as well too. You know, it gives you a chance to sort of express your culture and what's important to you. So those things are great. And then the other thing that comes to mind is is the storytelling part of things is is just creating that space to talk more about who you are. So don't worry about the scoreboard. Don't worry about the wins and losses. Just celebrate the fact that in team sport, every individual has a story. And then the great thing about team sport, in cricket's the same, is that when you come together in a team environment, you have an opportunity to create a new story together as a team. So starting with your personal story and, and who you are, then leading into a conversation about, okay, well, this is who we've got around the table, um, around the change room. What type of story do we want to create together as a team? Uh, and I had a conversation with a coach the other day who was very anti-storytelling. And he said, oh, I don't, I don't. I think he called it um, – what did he call it? He called it uh, hogwash, I think was the, the term he used. I don't believe in that rah-rah sort of hogwash, lovey-dovey storytelling stuff. You know, how's that going to be a benef- benefit to me? He said, I, I just want the players to work hard. You know, I, I, I grew up um, – in uh, a, a, um, a low socioeconomic suburb um, here in this country and, you know, I was doing a paper round when I was 10 years of age just to make some money because my mum and dad were on and off for work and so the money I earned, I was keeping half and then I was giving the other half to my mum and dad. So I just want the players to work hard because they get paid a lot of money. So all of a sudden he's actually shared a story about his life with me without even knowing <laughs> that's, that's clearly formed his coaching philosophy. Like he coaches the way he coaches and he has the beliefs he's, he's got about culture because of his story. So me knowing that makes me understand him even better. And so we were then able to talk about, well, did you, would your players know that that's where you grew up? And that's how you grew up and about you doing the paper paper round as a, a boy when you were younger. He said, oh, probably not. And I said, well, what about if you were to share that with them? You know, they might understand you better then and then that might kind of create a, uh, a bridge, if you like, between your story and then talking about what you want the team to stand for. And so that was just a really great um a great moment that just showed me how sometimes we don't realise that we are storytelling machines and if we tap into that ability, then we realise that stories are the fabric of human nature and they're what binds us together as, as, as individuals. And so the more we use stories in a business context, in a sport context, um, the sooner we'll get those breakthroughs from a, a performance viewpoint. Yeah. Yeah, that's huge and... My next question and kind of where I wanted to lead the next part of the discussion was around if you, you take two different examples, one could be the coach you just mentioned where there's there's a pushback against the fluffy, lovey-dovey, whatever terms you want to put around, <laughs> um, <laughs> whatever people. And that's that, to be honest, is the 95% in your South Asian cultures. Um, and then you've got an example like Richmond where you are quite heavily involved with Richmond as a football club. And, again, just through my experience of researching and just loving this world, almost all the leaders in Australia and overseas and to a point have seemed to have done some work with Richmond. You've got uh, Ben Crow, him flying, Brene Brown in yourself, Emma Murray, that there's all these leaders that come out of Richmond Football Club that – and – Obviously, going back to 2017 and earlier, not going so well, 2017, players are flying. You've got Cochin coming out from his leadership principles, Jack Revolt, um, Dusty Martin working with Resilience Project. Like I could go on forever with Richmond as a case study. Do you want to, as someone who's been involved within that story and that program, can you just talk through how do Richmond 
set this up and and how does it all work together there's so many different people in and out um there's psychologists involved as well what is what what has made richmond work essentially yeah well i think it, it is it, it has been a good case study in years gone by because the team went from sort of decades in the wilderness to then having uh, a lot of success in a sort of five to eight year period if you like and they're going through a transition at the moment so we're we're navigating that change where we're sort of the last premiership was 2020 which is a long time ago right so um, we have to be able to regenerate and find what comes next for the club but in navigating those transitions as a team or a business it's asking yourself you know, what do we keep the same? So there's almost like three elements to it. What do we keep the same? So what's foundational to who we are? Uh, and the All Blacks, you know, are a great example of that as well too where they're going through some change and transition at the moment. A lot of changing staff and coaches and players um, have been incredibly successful, but they'll be asking themselves the same questions. What do we keep the same that's core to who we are? Uh, what do we change? So that's the, the more material stuff. So what do we um, do differently? And then the third one's what do we evolve, which is sort of somewhere in between what do we keep the same and what do we change. It's sort of it might not be material or significant, but it's an evolution of sorts uh, to get from from one stage to another. Um, so I think every team goes goes through that, and that's really important as well too, is not to stay shackled to the way that you've done things in the past just because it's worked in the past. It's constantly having to challenge yourself around what comes next. And so that notion of curiosity, I feel, is a trait that pretty much everyone in the the Richmond Football Club has as a, a key character trait is they don't ever settle for what they have now like they're always looking for what comes next melbourne storm are another great example for people that know the story of the melbourne storm in rugby league they've been an incredibly successful team for the you know 25 to 30 years that they've been in the competition and they've got a mix of leaders who have been there for a long time um sort of ownership coaching players but then they've got this new fresh flavor of people every single year that bring new ideas into the mix of who they are but you look at someone like craig bellamy who's the coach the head coach and he's one of the the oldest most successful coaches most experienced coaches in the game of rugby league in fact probably one of the most successful coaches in world sport and he has this insatiable appetite for growth and he's hungry for ideas around what he can do differently year to year. And he and his GM of football there, Frank Panissi, who's also a long-termer, their trips overseas at the end of each season have become the stuff of legend <laughs> because they've been doing it now every year over the course of their, their time together. And they'll go away, they'll go to the US, they'll go to the UK, they'll go to Europe, they'll go to to Asia, um, and they'll, they'll meet with – other sports, other businesses, the military, um, you know, the arts. They'll go and meet with the ballet and musicians and all these different people who are high achievers in their fields and they'll just ask them about what they do and what they think works for them and they'll gather all these ideas and then they'll bring them back and they'll decide what are those top two or three ideas that we're going to apply that are going to help us grow over this next pre-season leading into the following season and so again they're very clear around who they are some of what they do is the same as what they've been doing forever but then there's this sense of newness and freshness and regeneration and rejuvenation and growth that comes with every year uh, and so I think that mindset itself is really important attitudinally whoever it is you've got in the environment whether they're you know a psychologist whether they're a, a mindfulness expert whether they're a, a leadership coach whether they're a CEO whether it's the board members whether it's the athletes and players, whether it's the staff, even the community department, the commercial team, the finance team, like anyone in the building having that mindset around what can I do to be the best possible version of myself and then how can I be hungry to learn about other environments from the perspective of curiosity. And it's not from the perspective of not enoughness. Like it's not saying I'm not enough or we're not enough and we need to do things differently. It's more how can I – 
to my point before about culture ad, how can we be additive in our attitude and add layers to who, who we are individually or who we are as a team that will make us better? Um, and so I think people asking themselves, when was the last time, you know, as a leader, if you're a coach or you're an athlete, player, when was the last time you went into an unfamiliar environment to try to learn something? Or when was, not even to try and learn something, when was the last time you put yourself in an unfamiliar environment, full stop? And if your answer to that is, well, it's been a long time since I've done that, then are you really serious about your craft? Because the answers are all around us. We've just got to try and search for those and and uh, and find them out. So, so yeah, I think that 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 part of things, just the the mindset that people have around um, being willing to learn from the outside, is really important. The other thing is that that notion that no idea is a bad idea either is is we can always get something out of any anything anywhere any time, I suppose. And so, I feel like sometimes a team goes through a period of poor performance. And that will become quite catalytic for where they get to next. And the reason it's catalytic is because they're willing to try things they wouldn't have been willing to try before. So it's almost how do you expedite that process? Is How do you not wait until you've performed poorly for a period of time, but you're being constantly iterative in the way that you're you're growing as a leader and as a team? So so that's, um, that's the second thing. And then the third thing I think of, there's a quote that, uh, we used quite a lot back in that first premiership year, 2017, uh, which was it's amazing how much you can achieve when no one wants to take the credit. And it's probably a bit cliche for sport, but I feel like that is just the essence of team sport is if you've got anyone, whether it's a player, a coach, staff member, if you've got anyone trying to take credit for things, then you probably going to go backwards sooner than you are going to go forwards Um, whereas if you've got people who are actually seeing what their role is in an environment and able to lean into that role execute that role really really well and and bring a a cooperative mindset so that spirit of cooperation and working together um, without seeking to take credit like I think that that will ensure that you go a long way and I think that's one of the great things about team sport it's why a lot of athletes transition so well into business careers and become amazing executives because they have these incredible transferable skills that they picked up just through having been a part of a team sport environment. So um, there's something very unique about team sport. And so people within, people working in team sport should also kind of display those traits. Yeah. You are um, an incredible man, Shane, in terms of just, I know how authentic and I can hear the passion in your voice as you talk about all of these elements and of my gut feel, we don't know each other extremely well at this point, but my gut feel is that the reason you're so impactful in what you do is because it sounds like it's coming from the heart. It sounds like it's something that you're genuinely a massive nerd about essentially. Um, (laughs) and, (laughs) And I think this is a really, really important part in that, for, for those listening and these concepts are talked about a lot but I think you're you, you just come across as someone who's living it and you really are living exactly what you're saying in that you're you're delivering things that you truly believe in not what you've necessarily only just read in a book and sounds cool kind of concept and and it sounds fun and fresh and the value add culture add concept is huge it's not always from a place of lack that we're trying to fill and it's not always a place of in place of or you're going to fit into this, come in and change and fit into this environment. It's more come in as you are and let's grow this environment. Um, and it just feels like you embody that. Yeah, I hope so. Well, thank you for saying that. It's very kind of you. I, I Yeah, I mean, I try to practice what I preach. I, I don't think any of us ever probably perfect that and it's a constant work in progress for me personally. Um and and I think that that's that notion that no one's there's no such thing as expertise really you know no one's an expert like we're all just human beings trying to do our best in life uh, and I think if we can if we can approach that from the perspective of well what can I what value can I add right now but then also what value can I add to each other like how, how can I how can I have the the most enjoyable joyful authentic interactions with the people that I work with every day. 
that will help me learn more about myself um, first and foremost rather than just seeking to teach all of the time. I think that that's a, a, a really good place to come from. And, it, like, you, your questions are fantastic because when I'm thinking about what's the best answer to give here or how can I frame it in a way that might be helpful for people listening, my mind's just lighting up with all these amazing memories and um, of, of just conversations and experiences and moments in time of which we get so many in sport, don't we? Like you can be a young player who's early 20s just starting out in your career. Uh, you can be a coach who's in their first role. But you've already probably stacked so much experience into your years of life um, and – Sports, one of those things where one season, <laughs> one season in sport, can feel like an eternity. Sometimes, you know, like all the different twists and turns and ups and downs, and it's a bit like a roller coaster ride. And and that's one of the things that I love most about sport in particular. Um, and so, yeah, it's 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 something we should stop and pause and and reflect on because yeah, you know, the old cliche life is short. It's just so true. Every day there's a reminder of why that that's the case. And so if you can't love what you do, uh, if you're not loving what you're doing, then there's always that opportunity to, to find, uh, find a way to put yourself in an environment where you love what you do. Uh, and, you know, I love that word soulful. I find team environments really soulful. And that's not just when things are going well. I feel like sometimes you see that that heart and soul the most when things are not going well and when people have to find a way to come together and work through the situation that they find themselves in. Um, and that's that's why sport's such a great testament to the human spirit. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I love the word soulful. I'm definitely going to start using that a bit more. Um <laughs> And one of the reasons, so just just to wind up, uh, the reason we came up the inside edge, it's because we're constantly searching for and, and a lot of environments that competitive edge. So what's the next thing? And it's a healthy question to be asking in a sense, but a lot of the time we're looking for that externally. So the latest technology, the science, the technique, the tactics, and the concept besides being a really bad dad joke cricket pun of the inside edge of a cricket bat is um, <laughs> <laughs> that um, you're, you're also looking internal. So so what is the person and the human side of it that you're bringing that will bring out that competitive advantage? And I think we've been through the last 50 minutes or so has been a nice deep dive into all of that. But I want to know for you personally, uh, a question that I ask all the guests that come on is who is Shane at his best? Yeah, um, well, I, I, I tell you, I'll, I'll give you a funny little story around Shane not at his best. Um, Brilliant. First, first, which was I, I'm not a cricketer, and I played a little bit of cricket as a junior, and I knew my my cricket career wasn't going to take off when I was playing under sixteens in a little country town, a dairy farming community called Bamorm, just outside Rochester, where I grew up, and I remember it was my third or fourth game. Um, and uh, I was playing cricket because it was the off-season for football and I thought I'll give it a go because I love cricket. I love watching cricket. Um, Australian cricket team were up and about at the time. The West Indies were up and about at the time. I loved the way that they went about their cricket uh, back then in the sort of late 80s, 90s. And and so I gave cricket a go playing and I still remember um, the captain said, do you want to have a bowl this particular day out at Bermorm? I said, yeah, I'll have a bowl. Uh, I'm happy to do that. I've been training a little bit. And um, we had three slips in that day and the guy who was at third slip was a bloke called Tommy Dempsey and he's about six foot six, this bloke. He was a giant at 16 years of age. And I ran in for my first bowl ever in competitive cricket um, playing in under 16s back in the country and I bowled a full toss. And Tommy Dempsey, who was in third slip, six foot six, he had to jump to catch it up straight up in the air. So that was that was my first ball ever. And so I made my decision that day that I don't think cricket's going to be for me. So um, that was probably Shane not at his best, particularly in the context <laughs> of, of cricket. A little funny story given um, the, the cricket flavour of the podcast. But uh, I, I think Shane at his best is someone who <sighs> – Keeps busy with soulful work, as I touched on just a moment ago, but who allows himself the space to do things that light him up 
Um, and and I think that it's very easy to get sucked into that sort of rat race that we find ourselves in these days where we're, we sort of feel that we need to be busy to be productive. Um, and, you know, it's one of those first questions people ask you is, oh, how are you going? You've been busy. Well, I think everyone's busy, aren't they? The, the trick is to not feel busy, you know, like keep yourself occupied doing things that light you up, fulfil you, but um, do it in such a way that you don't feel like you're spinning out of control. And so uh, I can probably get sucked into that just as much as anyone else can at times. And so I've, I've tried to become quite deliberate around carving out time and space to do things that just slow you down a bit um, or that might be more creative pursuits um, or that might enable you to connect with people you've disconnected with or drifted apart from. Uh, and I think Shane at his best is someone who makes time for those kinds of interactions. Um, yeah, but great question. Love that. <laughs> you probably didn't need <laughs> Not the crickets, easy to answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that, again, storytelling. I mean, it actually <laughs> takes, I'd argue that it takes a lot of skill to be able to bowl a ball that high and that wide. I know. <laughs> I, know, right? I, was so, I was so excited coming off of that first over. I've just let rip and, gee whiz, I'd love to see some footage back of that ball. I've got no idea how funny it would be. I could just put some sort of Benny Hill music in the background and it'd be quite funny watching it back. But um, but there you go. Yeah. Well, you, you could also argue that is you at your best because you are doing what you love and having a crack at something. And, I mean, the outcome, not ideal, but you're, you're out there playing. So... <laughs> What about um, but you, no, Barbie? thank you so what, much, Wayne. Me. Who, who's ba- who's who Barbie at her best? I should have a more succinct answer to this given I've ask, asked it to that many people. However, for me it is when I'm completely present and deeply engaged in what I'm doing and I find if I'm deeply engaged, I'm probably passionate about it and I'm probably not worrying about the future, the past, what other people are thinking, um, whether it's deeply engaged with you right now in front of me or whether I go out and train this afternoon, going to go play golf. It's just being where my feet are and engaged. The only other word I'd add is the element of play, uh, which can be broad, but I find when I'm playful and playful can, it doesn't mean just smiling and laughing. For me, play relates very closely to that deep engagement um, where you're curious but also completely present in whatever's in front of you. So as long as I'm doing those things, I generally find I feel like I'm in a good space. I feel like I'm moving forward. And at the end of the day, that's not a waste of time. So um, no matter what you're doing, if I'm playful, deeply engaged in it, I'm living my best life. Wonderful. Love that. Love that. Thanks for asking. Um, And thanks, Jane. So that that was an awesome chat. As I mentioned, you are... uh, a breath of fresh air in a lot of environments that where people are passionate and when there's passion there can be emotion and it can get very serious and very intense and to bring some of the elements that you bring in storytelling authenticity vulnerability and ultimately that depth of connection and meaning is amazing so thank you for all you're doing in our society today thank you for your time today and all the best moving forward thanks barbie great to catch up Thanks for tuning in. If you want to continue to be part of the Inside Edge project, hit subscribe or leave a comment below. We're also on all major social media platforms. I look forward to having you along next time.